看华尔街电视，我是节目主持人孙昌国。今天很高兴为各位观众请到了在加拿大最大报纸《多伦多新报》任职的华裔加拿大记者赵其新 （Joanna Chu）。他最近出了一本新书，叫做《China u n b o u n d a New World Disorder》。你好，新奇啊，其新啊，可否先为观众简短的介绍你的中国经验和你为何要写这本新书？嗯嗯，哎，你好 ，Gregory， 谢谢你啊、呃，你欢迎我来你的呃 program， 呃，我是一个加拿大的记者，我我在中国香港待七年多，呃，然后我回来了加拿大后，我我我发现呃，中国的故事是一个很国际化的故事，所以我想呃写。这本书，呃，可以呃，跟很多读者介绍一下，为什么中国的故故事是啊、呃，一个很呃国际的故事，很对呃国际的人有很多影响。是，呃呃呃 ，Joanna， 呃 ，You can speak in English, it's all right. Okay. So, uh, can you can you briefly, uh, uh, um, describe your book? And why you are uh you uh wrote this uh book? Okay, um, so I wrote this book um because let me just start over again. Um, so I spent seven years in、uh, Beijing, Hong Kong, traveling around China and covering the most you know the important stories um. In China,、uh, as well as things that interested me, because you know Chinese culture is so fascinating, so complicated. And returning to Canada、uh, in late 2018, I realized that my world, that was you know so just China focused, it wasn't everybody's world. Like China would be in the news all the time,、um, but it was always just the top stories, like the. Often, when there's political tensions, that's what people would pay attention to. So people weren't、um, getting, you know, the full picture. I think meant much of the time, and that's why I think、uh, when what happened with Huawei when Meng Wanzhou was arrested in Vancouver, and then the two Michaels, two Canadians, were taken as basically hostages. So many people were shocked, and they were. You know, turning to me,、um, Canadians asking me questions because they knew I had just returned from living in China, working there for seven years.、Uh, how did this come to be? Why is the CPP so angry at Canada that they would arrest Canadian men?、Um, so I set out to write this book to provide that really deep context for any reader around the world to try to understand deeper. Uh, how we came to this point where there are a lot of、um, just so many tensions and miscommunications and misunderstandings.、Um, that's why the subtitle of the book is "A New World Disorder."、Um, I criticize, and experts in the book criticize the Western society response to China just as much as、uh, they are critical,、uh, and I am critical of what the CCP has done because Western societies, I think, really. Have not equipped themselves with knowledge on China.、Um, it, many parts of the world that I traveled to, I went all over Europe and Australia, North America.、Um, people complain that there's not many opportunities to to learn about China, and when they are, they become experts on China. They're actually not very welcome as、uh, government advisors and. The people who tend to get more attention are people who、uh, primarily work in the business world, or if someone who has actually never lived in China but has some sort of really catchy ideas on the China-U.S. relationship. For example, those are the people who get these, you know, major book deals and go on TV, and、uh, often the narrative that comes out can be oversimplified and often. Talked about in terms of competition in the U.S., the major narrative is that China and U.S. are in a conflict, and it's ideological and existential. And if the U.S. isn't careful,、uh, Beijing will beat Washington and basically take over as the world superpower. And when these conversations are so about 
us and them and winning or losing. It seems that the human rights concerns, the concerns about individuals um, aren't prioritized. So um, can you tell us more about your uh, book? I, 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 it seems to me that chapter by chapter, different countries, right? Mm -hmm. So, uh, and you are uh, kind of uh, using the uh, concept of sh shock power that Beijing uh, is trying to use uh, this uh, shock power to influence the Western country and societies. Mm -hmm. Then uh, uh, in your book, you describe them as a, uh, a new world disorder. Can you elaborate it more? Mm -hmm. So talking about sharp power, I think what's interesting is that uh, the CCP uses more soft power and more sharp power depending on who they're trying to target. Um, when it comes to, for example, politicians around the world, they tend to try to use uh, tactics like flattery, asking them to go on these VIP all expense paid trips all around China uh, is part of a playbook. Uh, you know, former ambassadors uh, to China tell me of treating foreigners uh, with so much respect and flattery that they feel that they're special, that they're a special friend of China's um, to in, in order to win their loyalty. Um, so, but when it comes to people who might be more critical of Beijing around the world, uh, particularly members of the Chinese diaspora and increasingly also international journalists, um, who, who aren't of Asian descent, uh, that's where the harder power comes into play, where the CCP uses, like Chinese police use um, as leverage the fact that people overseas might have family members living in China to threaten them, uh, or businesses connected to China to threaten those businesses if these people continue to speak out or be more critical of Beijing. So I try to provide many real life stories in my book. So these stories don't seem so abstract that they're actually real. Um, and to explain also how widespread it is. So going to Australia, talking to people there, their experiences sound so similar to experiences of the same people, same type of people in Canada or the US where they might be students or you know researchers or journalists and all of a sudden, um, for example, in Canada, there's a student who has two Twitter followers and he only shared a few posts, including one that was a satirical video about Xi Jinping. And then Chinese police visited his parents back in China and said, your son is, you know, up to no good. You should make him stop. And then Chinese police called him and said, you have to delete those posts. But the student um, studying law, uh, he only had two followers. Chinese so, students or the... Yes, he was a Chinese international student uh, living in Canada. Um, but similar things have happened to people who aren't even Chinese nationals, who are actually uh, Canadian citizens or Australian citizens or American citizens. They might have actually even been born uh, outside of China. Uh, if they have family members back in China, um, that makes that's a very common tactic, like a sharp tactic to try to control their free speech, even though they're not living under Chinese laws and regulations, they're living overseas. But Joanna, don't you think that uh, different country has different perspectives? Like uh, uh, you mentioned uh, in your book, mm -hmm. that, like uh, in, in Greece, uh, uh, you were sh kind of shocked that yeah. people got a similar, uh, uh, um, very simple idea about China. And mm -hmm. then they even say that if uh, China can give me something good, why we can not make friends with China? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it was really interesting because I think in um, North America, Australia, there's views are becoming more and more negative towards Beijing. Um, but looking at the latest research surveys um, in Southern Europe, including the two countries I went to, Italy and Greece, and, and also Turkey, as case studies, uh, relatively, there are, you know, half of the population aren't particularly uh, negative towards Beijing and having a relationship with China. Um, there's a lot of optimism actually, and not you know, that much concern over politics or Chinese politics or human rights. Um, I think part of it might be that these places have 
quite low populations of uh, Chinese immigrants and diaspora. Um, and, you know, in recent years, like less uh, engagement uh, with China, it's become like the relationship is kind of more new. Um, part of the new Silk Road, Beijing has been making more of these um, relationship building with countries uh, in Central and Southern Europe. So in Greece, uh, after the Chinese state-owned company Costco took over the port of Piraeus, talking to actually dock workers who work uh, in the port, they're mostly satisfied. Um, the Costco was able to increase the uh, business, the turnover of this port uh, very well since it took over. And the Greek government seems very grateful for these investments. Um, and then in turn at the United Nations, Athens uh, vetoed some criticisms from the European Union on China, on the South China Sea uh, aggression, also on human rights uh, in 2016 and 2017. So you wonder um, whether it's connected, this gratitude towards Chinese investments in Greece and also uh, siding with China, uh, blocking the criticism against China at the UN. So, so I found that interesting. Um, in Italy, it was also interesting because Actually, historically, Italy and China has had probably one of the closest ties between Europe uh, and China with the original ancient Silk Road, you know, all the stories about Marco Polo and, and such. Yeah. Um, but, you know, speaking with Italian entrepreneurs and experts and, you know, think tank directors who are now focused on Asia, um, I asked them, oh, are you interested in Xinjiang or Hong Kong issues? And they say, they admit to me really honestly, they don't actually know much about those topics. They haven't followed them. Um, they're really primarily interested in how to help Italian businesses succeed in China. Um, and for some reason, when I visited in 2019, there were a lot of um, false stories about China's investments in Italy in the Italian media and social media. Um, I think there was so much hope because the Italian economy was struggling about Chinese investments that people felt that China would invest in things that China had no intention of investing in. So I visited Sicily, a port in Palermo, where I read that you know China might take it over like it did in Greece and you know improve it. Uh, but speaking with the mayor, he was laughing like he so many rumors, but there's actually no deal. Um, it seems it's really like Italian public feeling optimistic about China's investments, um, but it doesn't match up with the reality of the scale of um, interaction so far. What about Turkey? So Turkey was also a good case study because it's a country in Europe. It's kind of straddling Asia and Europe. Literally, it's on both continents. Istanbul is very interesting in that way. You can cross a river and be in Asia or be in Europe. So, and it's also a country of uh, majority Muslims. And there have been protests on the street, uh, putting pressure on the Turkish government to um, defend Uyghurs in Xinjiang and be less close to China. So Turkey is one of those places, many countries are facing this um, dilemma of wanting and needing uh, to preserve uh, relations with Beijing, but facing domestic pressure to speak up and be critical of the human rights situation. In Turkey, it's really personal because they identify with Uyghurs as fellow uh, Muslims um, and Turkic peoples. They feel that they have a common origin as Turkic uh, peoples and a lot of um, people like exiles and Uyghurs feel that they are also um, rejecting connections with uh, China and kind of embracing this idea that they come from Turkic origins. So actually tens of thousands have fled uh, China to, to Turkey where they're living in a state of limbo because it seems the government is, isn't sure what to do. It does not want to uh, block these people from coming, but it's worried about giving them full citizenship and rights or refugee status, uh, partly because they're worried about um, endangering trade relations and diplomatic relations with Beijing. 
Joanna, have you ever talked to uh, Uyghurs uh, in Turkey? Mm -hmm. what's, uh, what's the um, your idea? What's the general feeling you got from them? Uh, so um, I actually spoke with uh, quite a few Uyghurs who are now living in exile in Turkey. And actually for journalists who want to understand what's happening with the Uyghurs, it's not really safe to go to Xinjiang anymore to, to speak with them. Um, you could, even if the journalist is safe, um, just speaking with someone uh, Uyghur in Xinjiang could get them in trouble, could get them arrested. So a lot of the reporting right now is done through interviews with Uyghurs who have managed to flee, um, who can talk about their experiences. Sorry, I, I mean, uh, uh, those uh, Uyghurs are living in Turkey. Can they assimilate yeah. to the Turkic society? Mm -hmm. Or they, they feel, feel alienated from yeah. the Turkic society? I think, um, you know, the time I spent with them, um, a lot of them have, you know, assimilated quite well. Like the languages are quite similar. So a lot of them now, you know, speak fluent Turkish and can and can get around. And when people look at them, they don't think that they're a foreigner, especially if their language is really fluent. Um, the problem is that even the people I've met who are now teaching at Turkish universities, they still don't have Turkish passports. They don't have EU or any type of passport. They only have a Chinese passport that is often expired. It's not as if they can feel safe going to the Chinese embassy in Istanbul to renew it because they worry that they'll be immediately uh, sent back to China or detained. Um, so they're living in a state of limbo, even though they, many of them uh, get by and assimilate and, you know, feel really comfortable in Turkey. And I did speak to uh, one person who actually uh, spent 15 months in an internment camp in, in Xinjiang. And she told me about her experiences. She showed me photos and copies of her arrest documents. And she decided to go to uh, Istanbul because it's a, she finds it's a, in the Muslim world, it's a more powerful country that she feels safer speaking out about her experiences rather than returning to Kazakhstan where she was from originally before um, on a business trip to Xinjiang, she was detained and sent to the camp. Uh, Joanna, I'm quite curious. Uh, do you really accept the uh, uh, concept of gen genocide in Xinjiang? Yeah, so I think even the definitions of genocide are broader. It's based on international law, which includes uh, cultural genocide, so state uh, efforts to really try to stamp out a culture, uh, a people's culture. So in that sense, I think that's the definition that's being applied by some countries. Uh, but it is controversial because even though many experts say, okay, this label likely applies, is it the best way to put pressure uh, on Beijing to stop what it's doing, or could it um, further inflame tensions? So personally, I don't really have a strong view of whether we should use the word genocide or not. Um, I know that uh, what's happening in Xinjiang with really trying to separate families and stop religious practices or, you know, change religious practices and restrict them is a way to, I think, um, really, if not completely eradicate, but to make this culture more um, acceptable to Chinese authorities, um, less distinct and closer to the majority, you know, Han Chinese culture. Okay, let me play the uh, devil's advocate uh, here. After uh, COVID-19 pandemic, there are more cases being reported that Chinese Canadian become mm -hmm. the target. You used to mention that there was a lot of lumping together of the Chinese people and mm -hmm. the Chinese government. And we see a lot of xenophobia and racism against Chinese people, a blanket suspicion of Chinese students and scientists. Uh, uh, I quote uh, what you say. So that's very concerning uh, for you. Mm -hmm. What's your recommendation to the Chinese Canadians and mm -hmm. Chinese nationals mm -hmm. in this regard? 
Yeah, so it's very unfortunate that there's so much racism and xenophobia all over the world towards people of Asian descent. Uh, where me growing up in Canada, you know, my family, I myself was a target of racism. It's just really, really common. And it's very sad um, because it just, when it comes to purely concerns over uh China's uh, crackdowns on civil society or its intimidation and harassment of uh, people around the world, it's hard to talk about it with the nuance um, and complexity that deserves when people can jump on and say it's racist to uh, criticize China because um, you're being, you're criticizing all these people, but people are lumping to, the problem is that people lump together Chinese people and the Chinese government. For some reason, we don't do this to Americans or Canadians. Uh, we don't say, um, oh, what Justin Trudeau is saying, it's your fault as a Canadian. We don't lump it all together. But when it comes to Chinese people, um, it's all mixed together and people use um, criticism, you know, legitimate criticisms of uh, Beijing uh, to justify their racism and xenophobia to anyone who looks Asian. Uh, here in BC, um, even an indigenous woman was punched in the face because someone thought she looked Chinese or people who are Korean get spit at uh, because people think they're from China and, and spread uh, COVID-19. So in this type of really racist climate, uh, that's it also contributes to the state of world disorder because it's really, really hard to have conversations about how to um, promote human rights around the world when countries who are, you know, say that they're democratic and have all these values struggle to live up to these values uh, of democracy and respect uh, for each other. All right. I noticed that uh, this. Uh... Um, talk about another interesting topic. I noticed that when you work for the foreign policy, you wrote one article titled Sex Pet Journalists Are Ruining Asia Coverage. Uh, and uh, newsroom predators in foreign bureaus heard their colleagues and the news report. Can mm -hmm. you say a little more about uh, your experience in this regard? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so that's another problem. So foreign correspondents, um, traditionally enjoy so much respect and admiration when they're reporting all over the world. Uh, increasingly in Asia, um, people like newsrooms, uh, media companies are recognizing that it's important to have people who speak Chinese, who have some sort of cultural, deep cultural understanding of the countries they're covering. So that's why, you know, people like me uh, end up working in Hong Kong, Beijing, um, younger women, uh, of Asian descent. And my investigation for foreign policy found out that many of them have experienced sexual harassment from older, um, often white male colleagues in more uh, higher positions of power at all of these newspapers. It can be more subtle, like people um, reporting that they're being treated as basically um, helpers or that they're objectified, um, their appearance is objectified, two cases of sexual assault and rape that have happened. And I collected so many stories and it was really quite horrifying how common it was. Um, and part of it is that people are working more or less independently um, all around the world, far away from their, their home countries and their company headquarters human resources departments and many companies aren't aware when some foreign correspondents hire uh, local Chinese nationals to be their translators or assistants. So they don't get the basic protections because they're not even technically an employee of the company. Some news assistants in China are paid with like office expenses, like office stationery, you know, office internet, and then paying uh, Chinese a journalist is part of that budget and it's unofficial. Um, so I criticize some of the structures that support some of these cases of sexual harassment that uh, have been reported. All right, uh, Joanna, I'm wondering if you know the news that former Deputy Prime Minister uh, 
Zhang Guo, uh, Zhang Gao Li was involved in a sex scandal with a famous tennis player Peng Shuai. Uh, it mm -hmm. seems to me that you once promoted the idea that for Chinese victims of sexual assault, going viral is the best revenge. Mm -hmm. Peng Shuai's uh, uh, reaction, um, like Me Too experience, mm -hmm. and her Weibo article seems to be going uh, viral. Yeah. Can you introduce your discovery in China on this topic? Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you. Um, so I wrote another piece for foreign policy when I was in Beijing about how just similarly to all around the world, when victims of sexual assault go to police, often those cases don't go anywhere, police don't investigate, and perhaps uh, people say that's even more of a problem in China. Um, and there's a lot of stigma towards uh, victims for speaking out. Um, you know, their families don't want them to report to police. So what a lot of people have been doing, especially with the global Me Too movement as inspiration, that they've been going to social media. Um, they know that, or they maybe they've tried to go to police or talk to, you know, uh, people involved, but it didn't work or they don't think it will work. So they go directly on Weibo or WeChat to talk about what happened to them to identify their perpetrators. So that has happened many times in China and often um, people have not just um, the latest of Peng Shui, they've named other Chinese officials, in some cases, Chinese school principals or uh, more low level officials uh, accusing them of sexual assault. And then there's a lot of public support when these cases um, are publicized. And there's not as much backlash as you would expect um, of against these women, mostly women for speaking out. Um, but also it's, it's difficult to uh, often know what happened. Uh, so the posts that have become more viral and more supported are when, for example, one woman actually released security footage from a hotel uh, that showed that she was getting assaulted and that got really popular. Uh, on Weibo. All right. Uh, Joanna, I'm wondering if you can talk about uh, your experience seven years in China and Hong Kong. What's your uh, most unforgettable experience you have ever encountered? Oh, that's hard. <laughs> I feel like every day I went to so many interesting things, talked to so many interesting people. Um, I guess what's on my mind right now is my experiences in Hong Kong, uh, covering the pro-democracy movement there and just a huge- You mean the umbrella movement? Yeah, the umbrella movement where um, people of all ages and backgrounds in Hong Kong felt that they had a chance to push for more voting rights uh, starting from 2014. And they spent months uh, protesting peacefully um, clogging up streets, uh, taking over highways. And it was almost, now it's really bittersweet because, you know, back then there was almost this feeling of calm and happiness and hope among uh, young people in Hong Kong that, you know, through peaceful demonstration that they could achieve a goal they wanted, which is, you know, more universal suffrage and voting rights that um, was supposedly promised to Hong Kong with the basic law. Um, and the handover agreement. Uh, but now there's a national security law in Hong Kong and people who have even held up blank pieces of paper um, have been detained or people who have sat around reading Apple Daily, you know, they've been detained. And it's changed a lot. Uh, most agree that the national security law is not a good law because it is so vague and really seems to be aimed at um, pushing people in Hong Kong and elsewhere to self-censor because you don't really understand what the law says. You don't know how you would break the law. Um, so I know a lot of people are leaving Hong Kong now, um, just worried about saying anything about anything political there. Um, so my memories of just two years ago when there were over millions of people on the streets, um, I guess that's very memorable because I don't know if that will that scene will ever happen again in Hong Kong or on Chinese soil anytime soon. Mm -hmm.
Joanna, I uh, you happened uh, you became very famous uh, because you happened to interview the John um, McClellan, uh, and uh, uh, later uh, he told he told you something, and then you reported uh, this story, and then uh, uh, later he resigned. And we discovered that uh, uh, Meng Wanzhou, uh, you, you just uh, previously mentioned uh, her, mm -hmm. then uh, uh, the, the whole thing uh, settled. Uh, uh, finally, uh, don't you think, uh, uh, don't you feel uh, any regrets about uh, uh, his uh, status? Because uh, to me, it seems to, to me that uh, um, John McClane is uh, following uh, Prime Minister Trudeau's uh, uh, maybe instructions. Hmm. That's an interesting theory. I like, um, but I think at the time, Canadian officials really wanted the public message, and actually, Canadian officials have been consistent right until now uh, that what uh, happened, you know, with Canada detaining Hmong because there was an extradition agreement with the US, it wasn't political um, and that they weren't going to um, make it political that, you know, basically Justin Trudeau was saying that he doesn't have the power to tell the courts what to do. He trusted the Canadian courts uh, and justice system to, to decide. Um, so <laughs> what Mr. McCallum spoke with me about how there should be a deal, it'd be good for Canada especially at that time, it was really opposite of what uh, the Canadian government was saying. Um, so people explained to me that because McCallum was a senior diplomat and the, uh, the ambassador, he should have been closer at least to what the official message was. Um, so because it was opposite, that's why Trudeau asked him to resign after he gave that interview to me, but also, I was like the second interview um, a week before that interview with me for the Toronto Star. He gave a press conference to mostly Chinese language media in Canada, kind of saying uh, similar things. So he already got a warning after that first, you know, event, and then he repeated it in, you know, more stronger language to me. Um, so I think that's what forced um, uh, Ottawa Trudeau to ask for him to resign. Uh, but you point out that now, um, recently, there was a deal. Uh, clearly, even though the countries don't call it a deal, a deal was made where Meng Wanzhou was able to have her case resolved um, and go and home. Michael, uh, 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 and, yeah, and, and the, home, yes. yeah, and the same day that Michael's returned home, uh, clearly, China agreed to release the Michaels in return for Hmong returning as well. But still, now the governments aren't saying, okay, we made a deal, but it's really obvious what happened. So, yeah, I think it's interesting because it shows the complicated politics behind it. Uh, if different countries admit that deals can be made, you know, people can be released, um, it kind of puts into question um, the independent justice system in, in Western countries. Um, and at least in Canada's case, um, actually our officials did not interfere with the courts. Uh, Meng was continuing to fight her extradition in the court in Vancouver. Um, nothing changed um, as far as court decisions. But what, did, what the deal that happened uh, was US Justice Department and the judge uh, in New York and, and Hmong's lawyers. And they did not completely drop the case. They just uh, deferred the prosecution. So it, I think they found kind of this gray area where they can say they, they did not change uh, the legal proceedings uh, so obviously, but they gave her, a, gave, they gave both sides a way to save face, I think. Joanna, uh, 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 
带来什么样的好处？你可不可以讲一下？嗯，我希望呃，我的读者可以嗯、呃、多了解嗯、呃、这些问题是很复杂的，不是很简单。呃，我觉得很多嗯、呃、嗯欧美呃北美的呃媒体对。中国的呃呃问题，嗯，有时候是太简单说了，嗯，呃，所以呃，你呃，你觉得就是你这本书可以呃扩大这些读者的视野、嗯，让他们更了解实际上的状况是如何，是吧？你的意思是这样对对对？对，好的。非常谢谢呃，齐星今天接受我们的采访哦。那各位观众，呃，您可以看到，就是呃，要当一位出色的记者，其实也不容易哦。那呃呃，人生如果能够当记者，然后又能够呃碰巧采访到了在呃那个关键的时刻，采访到一个关键的人，而又造成了一连串的这种所谓的 ripple effect。我相信这个呃，齐星就是这样的记者啊。那他也是啊啊、呃呃，算是很努力啊。然后呃，离开中国以后啊、呃，继续的发掘跟中国啊、呃、没有办法脱节啊啊、呃，继续又写了这一本书啊。那希望各位观众看到这啊啊啊这个齐星的这个真面貌以后啊，能够也去买他的新书来看一看，扩大我们的视野。今天非常谢谢 Joanna 来我们的节目。非常感谢你，哎，感谢 Gregory， 好，谢谢，好，各位观众，谢谢啊、呃，收看，我们下次再会。